All right, I want to welcome in my brother, Corey Harris. This is our industry call for the committed community, also for the podcast. This is a time where we can really dive from, uh, learn from other people's experience, dive deep into what they've learned throughout their um, career, their experiences, their scars, the lessons. All these things, I think, is the beauty of having a community. So I want to welcome in Corey. Thanks for coming in, brother. Phil, my brother, thank you so much for having me. Coaches, what's going on? Hope you guys get something from this. And uh, hopefully I can learn from you guys in the midst of our sharing back and forth. Yeah, me and Corey, we go way back. We both come from the Gannon Baker tree. And it's been really fun because I've been able, what was really unique is develop this relationship with Corey going back to when you were in China, even beforehand, mm -hmm. and seeing your maturation, seeing your journey unfold in both sectors of the private sector of player development, skills training, being in your own entrepreneur, and then also coaching at different levels. And even we'll dive in a little bit about being a GM as well. But I guess I want to start off, man, in the player development side, when we talk about separating yourself, tell me about how you got involved with this NBA draft combine and kind of lessons you learned about working with players that are making it to the highest level. And that's a great place to start, Phil, because I think that's kind of the desire and the ambition of a lot of skill development coaches, specifically in the United States. Like, because we have, you know, the greatest league in the world, the, the National Basketball Association. Um, we, no, I guess we're not world champions or, or whatever the argument is going back and forth right now. Uh, if, if they win the championship, they can't say they're world champions, whatever. But we know that our league is is the upper echelon, it's the epitome. So as a trainer, by default, mentally, you just want to work with the highest level, right? And um, a lot of us don't know where to start. I definitely didn't way back in you know 2008 when I uh, first started this thing, but I at least had the vision of being on the floor surrounded by the best players in the game. So from there, um, I kind of was just feeling around in the dark as I went, you know, I just worked obviously with local kids, you know, six and seven year olds. But as I progressed and um, had the opportunity to connect with, you know, different guys who maybe some were local or they knew people that I knew. And, you know, the, the basketball world is not that that big. It is. But it's not like once you kind of get in, you almost are connected to everybody else because someone, you know, knows someone. Um, and like you said, the Gannon Baker tree is is vast. So after I graduated college and, and decided to, you know, continue skill development because I was I was coaching while I was playing in college and went overseas, um, that kind of gave me a little bit more of like a resume, you can say. And I was a little more valid in the eyes of some of the people in the basketball world that, you know, make decisions or that might uh, want to connect you and help you network. So when I came home in 2021, I was actually given uh, the opportunity by uh, the former owners of the Skill Factory, TSF, which is here in Atlanta. Um, I was given the opportunity to work as the director of pro. I was just attending an open run. And this is good for a lot of the coaches who might be watching this. And you wanna know how to, you know, maybe potentially get to a higher level within skill development. I just always went where a high level basketball was played. You know, whether that was going and watching college practices or going to other, skill development coaches workouts to just watch, learn. I never really went with a motive. You know what I mean? I just always was hungry for knowledge because I knew that I, I couldn't get there on my own. So when I went to a particular pro run that was kind of known like in the area, everyone knew TSF for having some of the best runs. Um, you know, I was sitting in the bleachers and as I was getting ready to leave, you know, of course, the, the people who run the, the open runs were down on the court. They saw me. It's not a big gym. And, you know, I never met them in person, but they knew of me and I knew of them. So um, they kind of motioned to me like, hey, you know, let's 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 connect. You know, let's let's figure out something. I didn't know what they were referring to, but obviously I'm like, hey, like this looks like something obviously I want to be a part of. So, yeah, for sure. And after about a week or so, um, that's when they made it known that they wanted me to get involved with their NBA pre-draft. So, um, you know, like I said, the, the experience in China, the experience coaching in college, AAU, um, the experience working within rec ball, YMCA, it all culminated 
together over time. And that's what led to someone giving me the open door to say, hey, like you develop pros. We see that you've coached on a pro level, like come in and develop our potential pros, guys that are trying to get ready for the next level. Nice. So there's a big part of you positioning yourself. And then I'm, I'm always interested to talk to people that work with pro players. What is your personal take or what you have learned on the difference between working with a pro and mm-hmm. working with kids? Ooh. And you can group those in. You can do what you did in China as yeah. actually player development and coaching, mm-hmm. also the NBA, and then working with a kid. Is it completely different skill sets or is there something that crosses over? What's your uh, take on that? I, I won't say that it's completely different skill sets. You know, um, my philosophy when it comes to working with professionals is children are doing the same things that pros are doing. They're just, pros are just doing it much faster, much harder way more intense, they're sharper, and they understand the reasons behind it. Um, On the pro level, roles are much more defined. Whereas with kids, that is actually positionless basketball. Like, especially when you're five, six, seven years old, rec ball, like, you know, if you can run, jump, pass, shoot, you know, rebound, defend, you know, it's not about like Johnny is a a, a center and this is the point guard. It's really just Whose skill set is the most developed? Whose body is more developed at this point? You know, who's a little bit more aggressive? Who's more confident? Um, But when you get to the pros, like you can have, you know, a a skill set to rebound or box out, but physically you can't box out a seven footer because you're six four, right? So we're not going to put you in the post and assign you to, to guard the other team's five man, right? So that's where roles come into play a a lot more. Um, I think with, with children, it's all about just giving them confidence. You know, like I want to make sure every child that I work with has a love affair with the game of basketball. Working with pros, I have to understand not all of them are going to have that same love affair. Like if I can, uh, you know, inspire them to, you know, rekindle that love that they once had when they were children. Great. I've done my job like tenfold. But how many of us who and I don't know, I don't want to just talk to coaches, but let's say, you know, you flip burgers or you're a plumber. How many people in the world really love their job? Mm. You know, and we have to really remember that a professional athlete, first of all, is a professional, right? They work, they 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 get W twos, they pay taxes, you know, they can get uh uh they don't get demerits, but they can get docked, like you know, they can lose money for being late to work, for missing work. Right. They can get fined. They can get fired. They can get cut. You know, they can get relocated to another, you know, uh, team. But really, it's just another job site. You know what I mean? They have a boss. They have managers <laughs> like it's, it's work. It's, it's corporate. So the biggest difference from a, a psychological perspective when it comes to training kids versus pros is the way that you approach working with a professional. You still should be childlike in your energy. You should still be childlike in your uh, infectious nature to just want them to, uh, you know, compete with joy and, and have gratitude and, and all that good stuff. But as far as like how you approach your work, I'm much more demanding of a professional than I am a child. Much more. My level of expectation is high across the board, no matter what. But if I'm working with a child, I'm not timing every single thing we do. I'm not telling you your percentage every with it. You know what I mean? But like with a pro, man, you I need you to make seven out of 10 right here, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know, right. ma'am, sir, whatever that like, that's not good enough. And I'm telling you that I'm telling you, like, if you can't like perfect this or you can't get this right, you're going to get cut. You know what I'm saying? Like the, your whole vernacular, your tone, everything. They appreciate the honesty because they want to keep their jobs at the end of the day. So the thing, staying on player development before we swing to specifically coaching, I I would say two things that really stand out to me that separate great coaches and, and player development trainers at the pro level and even with kids, the two things that really come to mind are knowledge and the ability to connect. Those two things, knowledge and the ability to connect. And when I say that, I mean... They have knowledge of what they're doing. The example I'll use right now is Phil Handy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the thing that stood out to me with Phil was 
how he greeted my wife, how he greeted every coach, how he greeted a child or a person, had an unbelievable ability to connect and gain trust immediately on the first one. And then clearly he knows his stuff, his knowledge. Right. When you're dealing with kids, the ones that I've seen that work the best with kids, and let's use even what I'm really, really diving into, which is beginners, is they had the um, knowledge and understanding of how a child cognitively understands information at that young age and how important it is to get down on one knee and go to their level, make them smile, help them fall in love with the game. From your perspective, what do you see that really separates like a player development coach or a skills trainer um, at that level that you've seen have, have been successful or even or even in your own experiences? On, on the beginner level or the pro level? Oh, let's, let's do both. Let's go pro level to start. So pro level first is results. Like if, if, if a pro is paying you, you know, let's say uh, to help him with his shot or to help her with her shot. Every day she's going to get in her car or he's going to get in his car and they're going to think about how they felt when they took their last free throw or shot their last three or, you know, and if they didn't feel good about it, you're the the, the bridge between those emotions and, and, the, and everything else. So, like, if they keep having multiple days stacking up where it's like, I'm not getting any better, it's going to go back to you. Like, dead stop. They're not going to say the ball, the gym, you know, I didn't eat breakfast this morning. That could happen once. But over time, if they're not getting results, they're going to start looking elsewhere, right? Like, kids are like this. Like, if you can entertain them, like you said, you can get down on one knee. You can keep them excited. Like I said before, a love affair with the game. Man, they're locked in with you. A kid don't really care about how much you know. They care about how you make them feel. I think that's in general for all people, but with a professional, I've seen pros work with people they don't like. Guys that they they get into real arguments with. Like I've seen coach and player like cussing each other out. And then you ask the player like, man, how do you feel about coach so-and-so? Because you think they're going to say something negative. And they're like, man, I love that dude. Mm. What? Because when I started with him, I couldn't do X, Y, and Z. And now I can do X, Y, Z, one, two, three times three. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, think of MJ and Tim Grover. You read all the way to the end of Relentless. What does Tim talk about? MJ told him after they finished, I don't ever want to see you again. Don't ever text me, call me. Now, is he serious? I don't know. But his whole relationship with the man was built on the trust that this guy cares about my job, my success, and what I do on the floor. That then leads into a friendship with a kid. You almost have to make sure that they know that you you love them before they'll accept your your information. You know what right. I mean? Like right. I still work with kids from time to time, and at the end of every workout, I make sure they know like I'm proud of you, I love you, and there's nothing you can do to change that. With a pro, I, hey man, look, we might work for six months. You're going to get an I love you out of me here or there. But, you know, there's some guys, man, I'll never. Hey, I don't care if I see you ever again, bro. Why? There was no connection. It was just I got you to a finish line. I got you what you wanted. You know, you paid me for my service. And, and as a Christian and as a believer, sometimes that's hard for us to understand. Like, you don't always have to come out of this thing liking the person you work with. And that's why some guys just can't handle working on a pro level. Like, you're not going to go to Sunday, you know, Bible study or whatever, have dinner with every player you work with. It's just, it's not possible on the pro level. It's, it's not. Um, Coach B, could you mute your mic on your thing? And Corey, can you go into talking about at the child level? Yes, sir. Which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, B, could you mute your mic? Yeah. Go ahead, Corey. So, so on the youth level, um, the thing that I found that separates coaches the most is actually their ability to be as professional as possible because with a child, you're dealing more so with a parent than you are with, with the individual player. Like the parent's belief in what you're doing, trust in, in your vision for their child, that steers a lot. Like think of and everyone probably in this call, as well as coaches that are listening um, after the recording, if you've worked with a kid who has a dad, 
and that dad, you know, played or he thinks he played or he just wants you to think he played. You know, without a shadow of a doubt, you're doing a good job. If the dad never gets up, never says anything, never steps on the court. You know, I'm not saying that's the only way to know if you're doing a good job, but you you kind of feel like, all right, man, if he leaves the gym and just drops his kid off and doesn't sit through every single workout every single time, he doesn't try to talk over you and correct like, OK, like I'm good with little Johnny. Then think about it on the flip side. What if you're working with the, the boy or the girl and every time they make a mistake, they look over at their dad? you know you ain't got them yet. Why? Because your word to them is second. They're looking for validation. They're looking for acceptance. They're looking for approval from the person or the people that are responsible for their upbringing. So with a, a, a child starting off just from the gate, being professional, well-spoken, on-time, punctual, having a clear, concise message of how you plan to develop their child, what are we focusing on in the workout? Not freestyling, right? Your language, your tone, all of that. And then just progressively taking them through each and every single workout, each and every single session. Like for me, if I don't have a word of the day or something to, to give them that's mental, that's not basketball related, like could be a scripture, could be something I read, could be something I saw. If I don't have something like that, I feel like my workout's incomplete. But that also is professionalism. Because the parent wants to see that. And now the kid comes to expect that. And then before you know it, kids will want to work with you even when they get the opportunity to leave and go work with another coach, right? Mm -hmm. The parent will be loyal and want to stay with you even when someone tries to undercut your prices because it's all the things that you're packaging within what you do. Now, that could be the same on the pro level, but on the pro level, I'm not trying to win over the wife the husband, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, you know, yeah. NBA players, I will say, uh, Phil, they come in with homeboys. You know, I, I dealt with that, you know, this summer, summers before where, you know, there's a posse, the bigger, the player, sometimes the bigger, the posse. So yeah, you do have to understand like the agent is going to have a say so, and they got to like you too. Right. But that's, that's not as uh, common, you know, with, with the kids, they're a package deal. So you you better be ready to understand like you're under a microscope from both the parent, but also the child. The child is watching how you deal with, with their mommy or their daddy. You know what I mean? Let's let's stay right here. You you brought this up because our topic is how do you separate yourself as a coach or a trainer in a saturated market? To me, this is a big, big piece that gets missing so many business owners, entrepreneurs that are skills trainers, they focus on their ability to teach the child mm -hmm. and they miss the piece of your people skills, your ability to connect with parents. Correct. Right. Kids are the ones you're trying to get the results with. Parents are the ones you have to sell. That's right. Parents are the ones you actually have to build that relationship with. Do you want to speak on that of how important that is or even some tangible tips or a story that has helped you build that relationship with the parent and how crucial that is for a skills trainer or a play, player development coach. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'll give you guys some tangible stuff first and I know stories will just begin to flow. So like presenting yourself, like what, what is your attire? You know, I, I'm a fan of, and I'm just being honest. I, I love dry fit shirts like everybody else, but I'll wear a collar shirt, three button Nike, you know, whatever, or just plain, coaching shirt. Hey man, like what coach? Like, nah, that's, that's cramping my, Hey, do what you do. But I know here in Atlanta where I'm at, this is a metropolitan area. If you know, we're counting trainers, it's like Mickey D's, you know, we're on every corner. It's like Walmart. You, you turn this way, you're going to bump into a coach that way. you're going. So how are you going to show that you're different? Like, are you groomed? You know, do you come in smelling like the last workout if this is your first workout of the day, you know, or do you do you actually like dress for success? I want to appear as a coach. I want to like even if you saw me from 100 yards away, I want you to think, man, I do walks like a coach. Right. So I'm big into your your attire. What's your uniform like? You know, I have facial hair. I, I had a full beard before I trimmed it. 
But I, even when I had that, it's lined up, it's kept. Um, again, I talked about punctuality, right? Um, I get there maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes before a session, just so when they walk in, I'm controlling the atmosphere. That's something that I, I learned while reading a book. Like whoever shows up first gets to control the temperature because they're the ones that are potentially going to greet the person that's walking in. If we walk in at the same time, now it's a coin toss. I don't like that. So I want to get there first. And if you see that I'm there first, guess what? Balls are out. I've got my pop-ups already out. I use like yoga mats because I make kids warm up. I've got bands. So my professionalism is not just in like my attire or the way I talk. It's in the fact that like I'm preparing you for an experience, not for a workout. When you come to me, it's going to feel like you went to another place. You've been to this gym before. This ain't that gym, bro. I transported you somewhere else. Get on the floor, foam roll, get that band. I'm doing it with you, right? I'm using terms and, and helping them understand their body and showing them how to like recover faster or just how to warm up properly, right? All of that is before the time even strikes zero for us to start the workout. I'm not going to start this stuff when it's time for us to work out. No, that's your fault if you're not warmed up as a pro, but as a child, I got to teach you. You don't know. You don't know. So we're going to jump rope for five minutes. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then when we start, we're going. So like when the parents see this stuff, man, you got a, a tripod with an iPad up and you're filming the workout on an app. Hey, it's a plug for y'all. Homecourt.ai. Go download that app in the app store. It's like 60 bucks for the whole year. You can uh, basically film your workouts. They don't take up space on the device. You can use your phone as well. It saves it to a cloud. It charts every shot, make and miss. It uses uh, AI, so artificial intelligence, to track their face or their clothes. So after the workout's over, you tag them. It shows you like six photos. Like y'all know when y'all log in on a, a website and it's like, are you a robot? And it has the six photos asking you to like say where the bicycle is. It's the same thing with the player's face. Right. All you do is you just tag it. So it spits out all their percentages from free throw, uh, three-pointers, two-pointers, off the bounce. It shows you how fast they run, miles per hour, everything. Gives me a link. I send it to them right after the workout. Who going to beat me if I'm doing that every day? I'm not just like working you out. I'm proving to you that I'm getting results. Johnny can't make shots off the bounce. Well, yesterday he shot 40%. Today he shot 45%. We got better. For the past month, we've gone from this to 60. Who who going to see you? Like, match match yourself up with another coach. It now is factual. It's not opinion. Well, I don't like him. Hey, with numbers. You see what I'm saying? Like, the professionalism is in your ability to make sure that what you're presenting and what you're offering is measurable. He's on time. That's measurable. I can look at my clock. Do you have a menu of your services? Like when a, a, a parent gets in contact with me, I'm not going to sit there and text back and forth, call, you know, like we're not talking for an hour. I'm going to just send you a PDF, a JPEG, and it's going to say my name, a nice HD picture of me and my rates. And if you don't want to work with me, cool. But like at least now, like, you know, they're like, man, it's like going out to eat. Get a menu. Yeah. See what I'm Sundays, I send you a schedule. I send a PDF with all the players' pictures for the whole week. I put a master schedule at the last. I, I'll, I'll send this to you, Phil, so you can send it to all the coaches. It's a template. You can just edit it on Adobe, right? But all I'm doing is every week, Saturdays, I talk to everyone. Sundays, I send it out. Everyone knows when they're working out Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. God, dog, who you like? Who who gonna beat you if you're doing that in your area? It's not the drills. It's your ability to just be a professional. You gotta remember, you're a business. Man, these are you're killing it, bro. Because I, what I use is I call separating factors. In other words, you do something everybody else does. So all I want to focus on is what separates you. What is your separating factor in your market or what you do? Uh, the collared shirt. I got Coach Mason on this live call. I know he loved that. <laughs> Always rocking the freshmen, the Nikes, the Jordan. I might come around. 
Bo Bo's on here. He like me. He like the cut off hoodies and all that stuff like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I love it. But every now and then I gotta, you know, <laughs> make sure they know. Like, nah, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. Coach B, he know that. Coach B might come in there. Yeah, he might come in there like straight from the beach. He got <laughs> cut off like straight from the he, beach. Like, <laughs> you gotta. You gotta yeah. Oh man. So, but another thing you said that I loved was the aspect of the experience. Mm -hmm. Right. When we did the committed to the craft, one big thing I said is I don't want a conference. I want a community. I don't want an event. I want an experience. Yeah. And that was how I created it. And traveling around, working with so many world class coaches and trainers, the common theme that I will say that I always saw was how they owned their space. Mm -hmm. And I got on the court with them, how their presence and how they created a culture or an environment immediately. Yeah. It didn't matter where they are. They had the, a unique ability to do that. And I love how you did that. Before we transition, can sure. you tell them about the transition, where they can find you on social media sure. and what you're doing real quick? Yeah, so uh, the transition um, is a resource that God gave me um, and is birthed out of the pain of not having uh, mentors, when I was younger and when I was first starting my business as a coach. So, you know, I'm not in this to sell you guys on just like drills or, you know, a curriculum that's going to be something you can just carbon copy. And now like you run with those drills and it's guaranteed to make your players better. That's great. I have workouts and stuff that I post. I'm actually going to give you guys a free PDF after this is over with eight elite workouts. So hopefully that helps you. But the transition itself is a, a experience like Phil is saying, to take you from the point A of where you are as a coach, whether that's a beginner, skill development entrepreneur, seasoned veteran, an aspiring like professional coach, like you want to coach on a staff. And I want to take you to that point or as close as I can help you get there by making sure that you understand the pitfalls that are waiting on you right now. And how am I going to do that? By sharing the pitfalls that were waiting on me. Because no matter where you guys are at right now, I've experienced something that you can relate to, whether that's starting your own LLC or trying to figure out how to make your own pricing packages or trying to figure out how to grow it, not having a gym, having a gym, wanting to coach, you know, professionally or for a team. And you don't know how to format a resume. You don't know how to even get an interview to getting interviewed and getting told no. I've been told more times than I've been told yes in my career. So like, just walking you guys through that uh, from six-year-olds all the way to NBA pros. And I didn't even play. Like, I played no organized basketball and then played college. So, like, this is not coming from somebody who had the yellow brick road, like, laid out and I had connections. Like, the transition is literally a curriculum, it's mentorship opportunities, and it's just free resources that I post online as much as possible to help you guys get what you need. So, um, Phil, I appreciate you letting me plug it real quick. Um, you can find out more at basketballcoachingconsulting.com. I'm going to type it in the chat. I'm going to put all this in the show notes as well. Corey will get all that afterwards uh, to them. But I wanted you to explain to them a little bit to give context as we transition. And this portion, you guys, is going to be exclusively for the community right now. So what I'll do is in the chat, um, B, Bo, Mark, uh, Mason might jump back in. And some. if you have a question, you can type that in the chat and then I'll let you jump on live here in a second as we transition into, I want to talk about your time in China, okay. Corey, and really let you unpack what you feel like you learned, any stories, but mm -hmm. tangibly, how do you separate yourself? We've got a community of about 160 right now coaches and trainers from all over the world and a big part is like how do they separate themselves so let's start in china you okay. were with stefan marbury but really kind of what you learned with that experience including the hard knocks yeah that really has helped you separate to what you're doing right now okay so to start off the first tangible thing that could help you guys um from that particular experience for me is preparedness um, before I went to China, um, as I mentioned to Phil earlier during this call, 
um, I was playing in college. So I went back to school super late. I was 23 when I uh, started my freshman year at a junior college in California. And then after that, I went on to play four years of college basketball. So I played five years total. I was 28 when I graduated, right? So I was already running my own LLC. I had my own business that I would do in the summers and I would just post content throughout the year. But the reason why China even became an opportunity for me is because I was prepared. So I always networked and I was a mentee. So like uh, Phil, I was a part of the Gannon Baker basketball coaching tree. Long story short, I had a passport. I had never left the country outside of like missions in DR or in Cuba. And so I had some opportunities to do some basketball stuff out there, but that was just through the, the missions work. I was never contracted or hired to go anywhere to coach. So when Gannon came to me initially about China, there needed to be a sort of like foundation already set where like I could at least accept the opportunity. So me having that passport and thinking proactively about my future, wanting to be international, wanting to be someone that could, you know, be led and be taken by God wherever, that opened the door, right? I wasn't so just green that like, I'm asking him like, how do I even get over there? No, like, I understand it. So when I got to China and I was working for G, the first separator really was just my persistence in my consistency. I think a lot of times we're looking for something extravagant. We want something new. We want something that's going to be exciting. And, oh man, I didn't know that. That's why I'm not successful. No, a lot of times the reason why you're not successful is because you just haven't done it long enough. You just haven't. Like if you put a seed in the ground, the roots go down first. The depth of the roots determines the height of the tree or the height of whatever plant. So if it's shallow roots, then obviously you're not going to have anything substantial. So I needed, when I got to China, to be pressed down. And when I mean pressed, like I felt broken. Like, first off, shout out to G. Love him. You know, that's my guy. But G is a businessman. So when G negotiated the deal for me to go to China and represent his company, I'm thinking I'm dealing with my brother, G. No, I'm dealing with a, a corporate industry leader, someone who's overseeing like a lot of moving parts and it's his job to ensure its success. I was a part of that, but I didn't understand the power of negotiating. So when I went over, I'm thinking, oh, financially, like he told me I'm getting, you know, 60K or whatever it was like, we ain't signed nothing. I'm just going off of the word. I get there, I learn Chinese law. If it's not written in Mandarin, it's not able to be upheld in court. So even though I, by that time, had an English contract that I did sign, no, I was getting something completely different. Fellas, I made $1,200 a month. Not $1,200 UN or RMB or, or Chinese, no, $100, right? So I not only was I broke and I'm not trying to act like, you know, there's people who don't make less than that. Of course, there are people who are less fortunate. But not only was I broke, I was broke in another country. You know, that's a different beast, <laughs> you know. So I'm living in the projects. I'm walking everywhere. I'm riding bicycles just to get to the subway or I'm riding a bike just to get to the bus stop, taking the bus just to get to the subway train station, taking the subway to get to another bus stop. And you can understand where I'm going now. So like I'm doing all that to make less than what I was making in the States. And I'm only working with like school kids. Like I'm going to literal school systems throughout Beijing and I'm doing after school programs. I'm not coaching a basketball team. When, when Gannon recruited me, I thought I was going to work with, you know, college level players and pros. And he told me, you're going to travel the country and coach coaches. Man, we did that the first week together in Chongqing. I think that's where he just was recently last week. We were together. It was amazing. Red carpet treatment, limousine, no, no exaggeration. You know, eating dinners with, you know, the owner of this and this billionaire. And as soon as that week was over, I was back to reality. So you go from feeling like, Lord, I have this potential that you've given me and you've given me a vision to now feeling like you're being forsaken. And like I said, the, the second separator is your consistency. 
there were other American coaches there who actually told me you might as well go back home. There were other European coaches there who told me, brother, I've been doing this for five years. Your, your situation is not going to change. I would tell them I'm going to coach in the CBA. I'm going to work with pros. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. They'd be like, like, okay, you're delusional. Like we will be outside in 20 degree temperature in bubble coats on asphalt, like, like real street, like working with kids. We will be on fields, like, like track and field with a soccer, a soccer field in the middle of track going around it. And we have a spalding hoop with sandbags and I'm doing basketball. And I'm like, Lord, where am I at? But I never, I, I thought about leaving. I wanted to leave. I didn't have the money to buy a ticket, but I, I made the decision, every one of these kids is going to be my LeBron, my Jokic, my Luka, my Kyrie. So that's my third separator. You have to have a vision that's unshakable, but you also have to have the like gall and the resilience to like be unwavering in the eyes of people who can't see it. So like if you're a skill development coach and your vision is to have the highest level of skill training in your area, you want you know, high school players, college and pro. Great. But like, are you unwavering in that? Is is someone going to be able to come along and like pitch a good opportunity to you? I had plenty of opportunities while I was in China to deviate the mission. Hey, man, come over here to this academy. You can coach this club team. You'll make more money. I don't want to do that. Like I had to remember what I was set on. And then going forward, fast forward all the way to my CBA experience. My first team that I was actually with was Stefan Marbury's team, but he didn't hire me. So I took a subway and a bus and I walked for like two hours to get to the other side of Beijing. They were doing preseason training camp. Steph had just started hiring out his staff. It was this time of the year. It was like late August, early September. So I get there. He and I have a relationship because we've done camps together my first year while I was working with the kids. He had a company that Gannon also was a part owner of, so we would collaborate and I would be on one court working with kids. He would work with kids on the other. So we knew each other. He had already retired. He's now just giving back to the Chinese basketball community. But he didn't see me as a real coach. I'm going to just be honest with you. So when I popped up, it was off the strength of one of his business partners who told me, Corey, Corey I can see your talent. Just show up. Just come to a practice. I'll pay for your hotel. You got to figure out how to get there. I'll take care of you. So I get there. I walk in. I've got my stuff in my bag. And I'm like covered. I'm drenched in sweat because I told y'all the, the trip I had to go through just to get there. He says, what are you doing here? I ain't had no words. Like my throat got stuck. And he's like, you here to work? And I'm like, yeah. He said, all right, you got the bigs for, you know, 15 minutes. I run. I don't even know where the restroom is. I run behind like a stanchion, like a giant column. And I just get butt naked and change. And then I run out on the court and they start the clock. And, you know, I don't know who speaks English. I don't have a translator, but it didn't matter. We rocked out. Dunker spot. Let's go. You know, bounce pass, dunk it, bounce pass, shot fake. Uh, we go for 15 minutes. And the bigs are like, you know, some of them are vets, some of them are young, but they didn't know, like, I was coming in there with, like, all this energy that I had from the bus and anger from the train and I'm walking and, you know, like they ain't know I had all that. So I just let it out on them. And after three days of just like, boom, 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 hitting them with that stuff, Steph went through the same guy that told me to come and was like, man, you know, I'm going in a different direction. Oh man, I was crushed. But that same persistence, that separator I just told you, it allowed me and it pushed me to go work with the Guangdong Tigers, another CBA team. They had me American Idol style living in a, a, a I don't want to call it a cell, but it was like a, a bunk with coaches on every bunk, multiple coaches, another coach from America, Europe, all Chinese coaches. And we went through a month long tryout where every week guys got eliminated, got sent home. So it was like a pressure cooker. Like you, you go downstairs in the morning, you, you work, they evaluate you. They don't tell you, but then they just give guys bus tickets. So the separator that I learned those 30 days in the months was I had to have a piece that passed beyond understanding. 
And I know that doesn't sound right, but like what had me settled was every morning I went downstairs at 5 a.m. And I sat in, in the corner, like the three point line in the deep corner. And I read a devotion sitting on top of like dummy pads that were knocked over. And I wrote in a journal, settling myself, grounding myself, having an understanding of where my strength comes from, gave me the confidence so that at 7 a.m., when everybody came downstairs, I always had a word. If you want to separate yourself, you got to be filled. Maybe that's what we'll call this separator uh, field. Like you, you got to have something to give something. Too many times we're going through our business, we're going throughout our day and we're pouring out and we're running on fumes. A lot of us are suffering in silence, especially as coaches, because you're always giving all the time. But as a coach too, uh, Phil Beckner, Damian Lillard, this guy, he talks about the four walls of the dungeon, right? We're isolated. We're not connecting. We're not interacting. We're not receiving and giving. We're just giving. You know what I'm saying? And we compare ourselves, especially in that state. All the coaches who were with me in that bunk were comparing. Man, you did really good. Dang, man. I don't... Man, did you see him? You know, then when one coach would leave out of the room, they talking crazy about him. You know, like it, it was a constant like, and I just didn't, I would leave. You know, I might, I couldn't go walking, but I would walk around the complex. Why? I had to make sure that like, I was fed and that nothing was like eating away at the thing that I actually needed to give to the players that needed it when I was on the floor. So I made it through that tryout. Um, I still didn't get the job there. They paid me like a couple grand for the month. I had an expired passport. The Lord blessed me and got me through uh, uh, TSA, not TSA, uh, through uh, customs and all that, even though they stopped me and they took me into the back to be interrogated because somebody thought I was uh, the Black Panther. I was Chadwick Bozeman, and they waved me through. <laughs> no lie. I had the chance to drive back then, so it worked. Um, but then getting to the CBA. So now here's the stuff you guys really can, can work with. Hopefully that other stuff helps too. Being an assistant coach, being a part of a staff requires a different level of understanding, cooperation, and collaboration. So again, I think, this also translates over to skill development. If you can't work with another coach, your business is going to be whatever it can be with you by yourself. The beautiful thing about Phil's business is if you come to an event he has, a camp, you watch a workout, you come to you know a conference, you know you see some of his videos on social media, there's so many people all just like doing the work, ministering, giving, pouring, imparting. You can't get anywhere, anywhere significant by yourself. And the skill development industry is almost like, I don't want to call it evil, but it, it, it is biased in how it makes all of us think that we have to just brand ourselves as individuals. That's why I got away from Corey Harris basketball and I went towards something that was faceless, like the transition, because I, I understood after those years in China, you need others. So number one, in order to be an effective coach, you got to learn how to collaborate. You got to learn how to work with someone else. As an assistant, we have to have uh, coaches meetings. We have to be able to huddle. We have to be able to share each other's uh, uh, likes, dislikes, thoughts. I got to be able to bounce things off you. You know, sometimes it's about chewing the meat and spitting out the bones, meaning I'm going to take the information you give me, but I might not like the way that you said it. Oh, well, that's just a bone I got to spit out. Like, you know, I'm not going to let that hurt my feelings, you know, but what you said was true. You know, hey, Corey, on that drill, man, you can't have him coming from there. That's not realistic. You know, hey, Corey, if they're going to do that, they got to go faster. They're not going to get open like that. Man, my, my OG, Jay Humphreys, who was my head assistant over me, a lot of days it was just him doing that to me. Like, nah, no, change that. That's not our philosophy. As a skills coach, I did everything the way I saw it. As an assistant coach, it had to fit within the team's systems. Big separator for you guys right here. Study the game. If you want to separate yourself as a skill development coach, even in America, not coaching overseas or not coaching on a pro level in the staff, have an understanding 
of what actually takes place in a game. Like, what's the pace of the game? Are your kids moving at the correct pace? If they're just going at one speed, even if it's like hard all the time, that's not the game. Like, think about it. You you walk sometimes, you explode and, and sprint to a spot. Sometimes you glide. Sometimes you back. But like, the, the pace has to mimic. Then the actions themselves need to mimic what you're doing in the game. Like, you can't just have them coming off a of pick and roll in some weird angle and just because you want to work on pick and roll today. How are they getting into that ball screen? Are they cutting without the ball and then catching it while the big sprints? Did they come off a pin down while coming out of the corner and catch it while the big comes this way? Like, if you understand what's taking place in the game, now your skill development work becomes way more purposeful, right? Do you understand percentages? Like, me and Phil are big on, like, man, you know, shoot like a pro or or make sure you're detailed or make sure that – so what should we be making from three versus from two in a workout? All right. So a lot of that stuff I learned in the CBA. And then just to get to the point, I know I'm long winded right now, but man, like overseas, you got a, a 30 second timeout, right? Just like in high school or college and you got a full timeout. You got halftime. But the only difference is when you're not the man or the woman and you're running the show like a skill development coach where you can go on a monologue and just like talk all the players heads off and be the only one speaking. On a staff, <clears throat> everybody has to have the room to be able to input. And so when we had a uh, half times, the team would go around the corner. It was all the pyro stuff would be going on. Cheerleaders are running out, security guards, you know, uh, media. We would go past them. We would bust right. Players would go in our official locker room. We would go in a, a staff room or it was really a closet sometimes on away games. And Steph would go like this, go. Jay would say something. Go. Coach Lee would say something. Go. Coach Chow would say something. Then he say go. He would point at me. And Phil knows the story. Like, first time he did that, I was just like, whoa, like, I'm the skills guy. Like, you want me to give you some halftime adjustments? So, like, I had to learn how to be quick, you know? And am I aware of what's happening? Am I taking notes during the game? Or am I making it up off the fly? How many of you guys are freestyling in your workouts? You watching this. I'm not trying to call you out and make you feel bad, but I'm trying to bring some conviction. Like, do you plan? Are you studying your, your clients? Oh, yeah, man, I know they game. Okay. But anything that you cannot track, you can't measure, you can't guarantee is success. So hopefully those are some some takeaways, Phil, some separators from the, the CBA experience. Oh, and also when dealing with pros, the players themselves, like Phil mentioned it earlier, man, you, you got to have a, a knowledge base. Like you got to know your stuff. You, you, you can't expect them to trust you because you have a, a title. Well, I'm the I'm the coach. That, that doesn't work on that level. Those guys are smart. They see through you. They know when you're lying. And they know when you don't know. So sometimes the best thing to do is say, well, what do you think? And and let them kind of steer it. And y'all arrive at the answer together versus you trying to be all knowing. Corey, that was amazing, man. I want to add two things. Sure. I'm taking like crazy notes as you're talking here. And you brought up two things that I think will go along with what you just said. And as soon as I finish this, be Bo, Mark, if you guys got a question, let me know and I'll, I'll bring you on live. One, you talked about collaboration. Sure. And you made a great point about this because a question I get all the time is, how did you scale up? I have now 10 on staff with me. And let's say uh, seven of them are trainers and all seven are gifted enough to be solo. Yeah. They're not like just soldiers. These guys are all gifted enough to run their own thing. And five of them have their own thing. They just partner with me. Okay. But what I realized, what you just said early on, was that the psychology of who we are as skills development coaches is we don't want to work for someone else. Right. Like we want to, we want our own thing. Most of us got into this because we hated a coach or we thought they were an idiot. And we said, I can do way better than this idiot. And the problem was 
is we, we created an even harder job because now we're the head coach, we're the trainer, we're the marketer, we're doing social media, we're scheduling, we're doing everything. And we don't realize that at first. And what I realized was each of these guys are more willing to sacrifice for the mission if it's something they can believe in. Philip Morrison basketball is not something they can believe in. Because mm. now you don't work with me, you work for me. That's right. But Hoops for Christ is something they can go, I can get behind that. That's right. All right. And listen, we operate almost the exact same way. It's just the name is different. That's right. And I found psychologically at people's core is they want the autonomy. Mm -hmm. They want to feel like they have ownership and control over it. Beautiful point you made there, Corey. And the last thing, um, I learned this from Tyler Colson, but he stole it from Rick Bettino. It's called the seven-second rule. He would mm -hmm. let his assistant coaches talk in practice at Kentucky and at Louisville if they could make their point in seven seconds or less. So if you were going to go over seven, you I mean, you're either going to lose the privilege of opening your mouth in practice or – it better it better be worth longer than seven seconds. Yeah. And my challenge to everyone here is what is your why or your purpose with the game in seven seconds mm. on spot? I thought about that deeply and I turned it into seven words. And it, what mine is, is I use basketball to share the gospel. And I know you're counting right now. It's seven words. I promise it is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point is, can you tell me what yeah. your why is, what's your purpose in seven seconds or less?